After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Yes, welcome to The After Show on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content, and we are broadcasting live and waiting to hear from you at the end of day one of the DSP Leaders Summit on Edgenomics. We've got a great lineup of guests joining us today and we're going to answer as many of your questions as we can. So if you haven't yet got in touch, then do so now and the sooner the better. Don't leave it too late. Act now to avoid disappointment. There's a form on the website below this video. Time to introduce my co-host for the after show, Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Hello, Ray. Now, earlier today, we explored various partnership scenarios for edge hosting for 5G, and three of our panelists are back for this live Q&A. But what are your highlights from the discussion? Well, Guy, I think the key takeaway for me is that in many ways, it's a massive juggling act. So many new distinct opportunities and use cases. Uh, anyone could be a neutral host, but how does that scale? Uh, edge assets primarily for one major internal reason at an operator, such as OpenRAN. That could be the determining factor alone for some service providers. Uh, it seems we're still at the exploratory stage in terms of figuring out if there are uh, any concrete tech and business models that can be applied to this space. But lots of different operators have their own very uh, distinct views about why they are offering edge services and how. And uh, talking of the technology that enables all this, let's not forget we also today posted up a great one-to-one -one interview with Dominic Schneiders from Deutsche Telekom who provided a really interesting deep dive into some of the considerations facing network operators as they seek to manage low latency scenarios. Specifically, he was talking about a managed latency approach. It was very interesting. Yeah, it was a fascinating discussion with Dominic and a very interesting approach, as you say. Well, on with the show. Uh, we are live. Anything can happen and often and always does. And joining us live on the programme today are... Neil McRae, Managing Director, Architecture and Technology Strategy and Chief Architect for BT. Eve Bellago, Director, Network Strategy with Orange. Francesca Cerevalli, who is Emerging Technology Director for Colt Technology Services. Michael Entner, Digital Transformation Officer, Telecommunications at Wind River. And Terrier Jensen, who is Senior Vice President, Head of Global Network Architecture and Director of the 5G Readiness Strategic Programme Technologies and Services at Telenor. Hello everyone, very good to see you all again. Now we've got lots of audience questions to get through in the next 45 minutes or so. So Ray, over to you to start us off. Uh, thanks Guy. Uh, so uh, Eve, here's our first question today. Uh, how are service providers charging for edge services and how will revenue share agreements be managed? Uh, thank you, Ray. Uh, I would answer, in fact, pretty two different answers if we talk about the enterprise market or the uh, residential uh, market. On the enterprise market, Edge services are in fact part of a bundle, so this is one of the services that we would that we will uh, discuss with uh, the customer. And the pricing is part of the overall bundle, part of the negotiation. That's just one uh, one line to be discussed among among others. No, nothing really uh, new on that. And when it comes to the uh, residential, it, and especially if we're talking about five G. Um, in fact, as, as you mentioned, a lot of things are under discussion, are being developed, and I would say it's a bit too early to have a clear answer on what, on what that will be, the pricing, what will be the value chain, how will, what will be the revenue share, all that is still, still to be defined, in fact. Okay, thanks, Eve. Uh, Neil, over to you on this one as well. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with Eve. So I think, I think there's, there's two things to think about. One... You know, on, on consumer and residential, um, there are some use cases where could we charge more, particularly things like gaming, but it's it's probably, you know, it's probably not majorly significant. For me, though, I really believe that Edge and 5G gives us 
a new opportunity to reset how organizations think about how they work with telecommunications operators. I think Edge and 5G and, and full fiber allow us to go into uh, organizations with a, with a much more um, outcome-based approach to pricing. Uh, and I think, I think telcos have to do that. I think this, you know, we, the world where you paid a, a fixed amount and it was all you could eat, um, isn't go, isn't working for us as telcos, and I think we've got to really change the the whole game on on how we do pricing and billing, uh, and how we charge for value, but also ensure that we underpin that value, uh, which I think our customers will expect and actually will will be will be open to to engage with us on. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Lots of moving parts here, lots of different models coming into play. Uh, Francesca, let's come to you now on this, on, on, on pricing and revenue share model potential. Yeah, I, I think from core to perspective, it really depends on the type of business model. And the business model that we are considering for our edge-centric networks are infrastructure as a services, where we want to level, monetize uh, our edge uh, capabilities to host uh, to host uh, uh, software stack from our partners, being you know security, uh, telco stack, uh, or even like managed VNF from from third part partner partners. Uh, it could be you know a NAS proposition, network as a services uh, to to offer uh, network services on demand to our enterprise customers. Uh, but we also uh, have PaaS platform as a services, whereby we work with uh, cloud service provider to enable uh, to give uh, our customers uh, the opportunity to access cloud services at the edge. And finally, solution selling, hosting 5G capability, IoT platforms, uh, the, the, uh, the SaaS marketplace as well. And in that case, probably we, we, we are going to work with SI as a go-to-market partners, and it will be uh, a revenue sharing agreement with them. But it's still early early uh, phase to, to say how it will, uh, in terms of, uh, of revenue and quantifying it, but uh, we believe that uh, around you know those business model there is a lot of uh, monetization opportunities okay well that's what everybody wants to hear all those monetization uh, opportunities that's what that's why everybody's doing this at the end of the day uh tell you, yeah let's come to you now yeah just a quick one i think uh, i fully agree with what eve uh, was saying uh, and uh, so it's a better question uh, or the basic question is what are we actually going to sell and, and who are we going to sell it to uh, and then I think Eve captured it in the sense that, OK, if you want to sell cloud services, uh, then you have to ask the question, OK, so what is the value of moving that cloud services closer to the customer, which is typically an edge uh, edge cloud yeah. service in, in that sense. Uh, and then, of course, that should uh, could have a value issue is, of course, that uh, that uh, charging of cloud services uh, is out there. There are price lists out there. Uh, so, so you have to ask the, probably yourself the question on, on do you want to charge it differently if you want to sell a, a cloud service as a standalone service? So, so what? Uh, and of course, then, are, then there are resale model and revenue share model around that one if you want, uh, which is fairly, I would say, forward. It's a commercial discussion, I would say. But I think what Eve is also saying is that there is a much bigger maybe opportunity uh, besides that, uh, where we see that the edge cloud services is part of a bigger uh, bundle. Uh, or, or a bigger one component over, over a number of components. Uh, and so it's actually a, a problem uh, we are solving. Uh, and, and it's more like the, what is the customer asking for? And I think Neil also mentioned that what is the value for the customer? Uh, and then that we have to tailor the services accordingly to that. Uh, and that could be uh, in the B2B and it could also be in the B2C, I think. Yeah. So that's, uh, there are a number of, of good discussions around the, on the edge cloud services. Uh, what we see is that it's actually this is one component of a bigger component which what the customers are asking for. And in particular, the, of course, then the enterprise customers. So we have to bundle it okay. together probably with connectivity, probably with security, probably with some devices, maybe applications uh, and so on. Yep. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Terry. And Neil, you wanted to, to come back and give another comment there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, just I think one thing we need to be careful about is talking ourselves out of an opportunity um, because we're too focused on the underlying infrastructure. So, you know, Tesla make a new type of car, but it still gets you from A to B. Um, but they don't say, well, it's just a car. They go out and say, this is why it's brilliant and why it's different. 
I think Edge 5G full fiber gives us that opportunity to go out there and say, hey, customer, we're able to, to work with you and your business in a much closer, more dynamic way than we've ever been able to work, work with you before. And I think we have to put that in, in front of, you know, whether the, the true cost of moving infrastructure makes a difference or not. You know, I think that's largely irrelevant in terms of the sort of big outcomes that we want to help customers deliver. Um, and, and quite often in telco, we're kind of well, it's just another box in the network. Uh, I think you know, let's let's think let's think much beyond that. Let's think about what what we can build as solutions and how we can help uh, customers really move their businesses forward, or 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 make their lives better if if it's kind of consumer and residential. Yeah, and I, and I get the sense that um, that that kind of thought process is happening on both sides as well. I think the enterprises definitely are seeing a real opportunity, and they're being more proactive as well, and that's helping to stimulate the whole market. I think. Um, okay, Guy, uh, shall we move on now to uh, to the next question? Yes, Ray, thanks very much, because uh, we are already getting questions in um, just we are. minutes after we started the programme, <laughs> so it's just absolutely yeah. terrific. Uh, here's our next question from someone who's obviously watched today's uh, earlier round table. And, and Neil, I'm going to stay with you and, and come to you for the, 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 your first response on this one. The question is, on the basis of this morning's session, Edge doesn't sound like a no-brainer for achieving cost reduction in a telco. So can panelists talk about what level of revenue growth they believe would make Edge a worthwhile investment? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. I think, <clears throat> and, and let's, let's be cautious about saying Edge doesn't, opportun doesn't offer cost out. It absolutely does, particularly video services. It'll help us save tons of capex in the network, and and we're doing that right now with 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 our Edge Quilt platform. So, um, what 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 else does it need to do? Look, I think the television industry, you know, it's it's a, one of its most challenging points in in the history since I've worked at it. I think Edge allows us to go in and be much more part of an enterprise customer's whole business, be it you know transportation be it smart cities and government, be it manufacturing. I think the, the power of the network and, and the power of 5G with Edge allows us to automate and digitize processes that, that perhaps are really manual or time consuming or very repetitive. And, and I think if, if you look at what Edge is gonna give us, it's gonna give us a number of kind of horizontal capabilities that we can jigsaw puzzle together to provide a solution for customers. I think Francesca's comment about working with partners is going to be crucially important, but I also think telcos are going to have to go out there and, and acquire more on-the-ground skills that are, that are able to support certain industries across certain horizontals. So, for example, billing. Telcos are mostly brilliant at billing. We have the odd, we have the odd hiccup, of course, but, but we know how to do complex billing. How could we bring that solution together with with you know real time shopping where you just pick something up and walk out, and our edge platform is pointing cameras everywhere and and, and showing you how to do that? Now Amazon have done that for their own shops, but can we help competitors of Amazon do that? Because I think they're looking for technology partners, and and it is about those horiz bringing those horizontal capabilities and then kind of applying them to specific vertical markets and different modules to bring value. I think I don't think we have a choice on this whether there's revenue there or not. I I, I believe there's massive revenue for us, uh, you know, in the in the multiples of of billions across the whole telco industry. And I think if we don't go and get our piece of it, then the partners who 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 are out there will definitely go get it because they see the demand as well. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, a good point there about uh, to remind us all about the the cost savings with with video. Um, from the edge, uh, Terrier, did you want to, to come in with uh, some comments on this this issue of you know revenue versus investment equation? No, I think I just support the Neil. I think we also seen the same on, on of course on efficiency. So I think uh, to get the content uh, uh, closer to the customer and, and of course there are efficiency improvements there. But I think uh, probably even stronger what what uh, what Neil was saying that uh, edge for us is actually one of the components to get closer in the dialogues with the customers and then. Uh, when you're sitting down with the customers, you, you are uh, uh, faced with their short-term needs and their long-term needs, and uh, 
And these uh, short-term needs are, for example, some of them are they want to modernize their IT infrastructure, which they have in the basement. They want to try to move it on to a cloud platform, but they don't want to move it out of the building. Uh, and that's kind of uh, for, for privacy or confidentiality reasons, for example. And then they have a lot of, of uh, also, they want to digitalize the way they are running their business. Uh, they know that they have to, uh, you know, take a step over to the to the cloud platform because that's where the application and the development speed is, is happening. Uh, but they still want to have it very local. Uh, so, so in that sense, I think uh, the edge cloud is actually becoming one of the components on, on, uh, to sit down with the customers and come with a proposition. Uh, which is then uh, solving uh, the problem they have on the short term. And then, of course, they have uh, additional requests on the longer term, new applications becoming more efficient and so forth. So I think that's the kind of a, a customer case by case, in a way, what we are looking into. Uh, and that's also where we have to look into the, the return uh, on the effort in that sense. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, it's, it's not just a straightforward equation, is it? Uh, Francesca, you'd like to come in and, and comment? Yes, yes, I think it's a it's a great question, and uh, you know, edge it is a, a very capex centric opportunity, uh, but we, we still believe that uh, the revenue it's as it, it becomes it can become an, a platform to enable new revenue, and that's why our plan is to scale globally our NVI platform. Um, as you know, we think uh, use case are many uh, from distributed telco cloud where we can upsell services to our uh, enterprise customer as they look to provision network services on the edge to enable cloud or ramp. Uh, we can enable distributed security working with partners like the scalers and, uh, and others. Uh, we can enable distributed cloud. We have already made some announcement for, uh, with, for our partnership with, uh, with IBM. Uh, and then, uh, as uh, Neil uh, also mentioned, we can enable, you know, uh, um, solution selling uh, towards our customers uh, as we can assist them through their digital journey through edge-enabled application. Thank you, Francesca. Um, lots of opportunities there you've just articulated. And Eve? Yes, and in fact, I see one case that even before or without talking about any additional revenue, I see Open Run as being a strong driver to, to Edge. And in my mind, that, that's um, in fact a bit um, uh, symmetrical to 5G, in fact. Uh, what happened with 5G? We had the question for years. What will be your Delta RQ? What will be your additional revenue that would justify you invest in 5G? In fact, there is a basic uh, justification to invest in 5G, which is just increase the capacity and the performance of the network, even before talking about any additional revenue. And in my mind, in fact, Open Run with Edge will be kind of similar. The Open Run will justify deployment in Edge, even before talking about any uh, potential additional revenue that will come later. Yeah, that's an interesting comparison. Thank you, Eve, for that. Um, well, if we've e exhausted this topic, um, should we move on, Ray, to our next one? Okay, great. Yes, our third question today. Um, uh, our next viewer question is going to come to Michael. But before we get to that question, Michael, this is your first time on the After Show. So a quick question to you that we've been uh, asking all of our new guests this year during their first appearance on the show. How did you get into telecoms? How did you start your career in this industry? Uh, mine is kind of a history of flirting with the telecoms. Uh, I originally started working. One of my first jobs ever was Bell Atlantic. I worked in a help desk. Uh, that was my first introduction to the telecoms. I was executive level support, worked with all the top execs, giving them, you know, their their access to their desktops, to laptops, things like that. Um, but in the process, started learning a lot about the the industry. Uh, left, went into consulting, um, really focused on infrastructure type consulting. Uh, came back uh, via another company called Paranet, which was a consulting company out of Houston. Uh, no sooner was I hired by Paranet that we were acquired by Sprint. So once again, back into the telecom and uh, did that for a number of years, uh, building a uh, branch in North Carolina. And then I went out to do other things, uh, eventually continuing on to PwC in a consulting capacity. And about eight years ago, Verizon decided that they wanted to bring in people that had consulting expertise um, and apply it to the telecom sales uh, to be able to bridge all the different products and services across the uh, entire organization. 
So went to work for them and was there for six years, uh, working across all the different, uh, I'll call them silos, but different organizations, business units, uh, to bring our customers very cohesive solutions that answered the, the business challenges. So that's, that's my history in the telecom. Okay, right. So you keep on coming back. Hard, hard to get away once you're in. That's what that's what we've yeah. been hearing from lots of lots of different people. Okay, so uh, let's uh, deliver our, our audience question uh, to you, Michael. Sure. Um, and it, it's it, it's it's very short one, and it's clear where this one is coming from. And the question is, I am a developer. How do I find out about Telco Edge opportunities? Oh, that's a good one. Well, first, let me say we need you um, desperately. If you're an edge developer or somebody developing in this space, uh, we do need you in our environment. Um, but I will give you this one piece of advice, and that is understand the use cases for edge technology and then follow those use cases to the jobs. So we at uh, Wind River do a lot of work around identifying the use cases for our customers and figuring out which ones make sense to them, right? And we know that there are certain ones that are going to lead the pack. If you look at if you look at the edge use cases as they stand right now, and not to say that things won't change over time, we're seeing healthcare is a critical area for edge use case, uh, smart infrastructure, somebody mentioned it a little bit earlier, uh, smart cities, things like that, autonomous driving, um, and the software de defined transport world is going to be huge. Um, lots of interplay between systems. And then really, you know, we mentioned that, I don't know how we describe it all the time, but the far edge services. So everything that, that sits at the edge that the telcos care about and that private enterprises care about, things that will deliver low latency type applications uh, that will deliver AR, VR, uh, VRAN, uh, Mac, right? All those different use cases uh, for things that will sit there. That is, that is how you find the jobs. You need to identify those areas where you feel you have expertise, um, look at those use cases that make sense from an edge perspective, and then follow them to the companies that are doing that work. And you will find opportunities at the carriers, you'll find opportunities at software developers, infrastructure, um, infrastructure companies that, that develop boxes and things like that at the edge. Um, so there are a number of places to go to work. And um, the one thing you do need to keep in mind is that you'll need to understand uh, CI, CD development processes because it's a very integrated, uh, very continuous development chain for applications at the edge, but that's where we're going. Um, companies like Wind River are helping companies do that, build those CI, CD processes. Um, you will also need to understand things like Kubernetes, containers, because all of the applications are moving from monolithic type delivery uh, where they sit on top of an operating system to containerized delivery where they're just little you know, modules floating around at the edge that connect to each other and, and talk and do what they need to do. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on. I think if you're interested in that area, it's a phenomenal place to be. I mean, we definitely are having trouble finding talent again. Okay, well, lo lots of great advice there, Michael. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, Francesca, what, what would you say to um, uh, any developers looking to find out more about Telco Edge opportunities? Yeah, yeah. I, I would like just to add on top that this opportunity in terms of new use case, innovative use case, can be leveraged only if the service providers and the cloud uh, providers have created and developed some synergy to make the edge to work as a, as a pass and enable distributed cloud so that you know, developers can access at the edge the DevOps environment and the uh, CI and CD uh, pipelines that are available from the normal, you know, cloud uh, uh, cloud services, and they can also, for example, access uh, the data management pipeline and the uh, and the analytics capability to create the MVP in terms of uh, you know uh, ML. Um, so I guess I think one important aspect I want to highlight is that it's really important that cloud service providers and uh, telco work together to give this possibility, the edge possibility to, to developers. Yeah, absolutely. It's got to be, the whole industry has got to be uh, inviting people in to, to get involved, to become part of the ecosystem. Okay, A any other um, feedback on this question at all? Or, uh, sorry, Teria. 
Yeah, just a quick one. I think uh, my advice is just reach out. Uh, I think we, we have been running, and, and a lot of operators and also the big, bigger industry have been running several uh, research projects, for example, uh, which is in this area, uh, partly funded by, by the European Commission. Uh, and those are, are typically, you know, make preparing a platform, uh, which is then open uh, and uh, semi-open for others to, to come with applications and also uh, engagement on the on development side for, for solutions. So I think it's uh, it's uh, very good if you uh, if there are anyone having you know concrete ideas on on use cases or something they want to test out, look for w what's happening out there on the. Uh, there are quite a few things uh, both on the lab side and also on the research projects and also uh, with with demo cases with specific customers which are in the media for example. So just uh, pick up the, the the contacts and and reach out I think and and uh, get going. Yeah, absolutely great point, and we we see more and more of these opportunities for people to get involved and go and test things. Uh, Neil, we'll come to you now. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think app developers focus on writing great apps and we'll come and find you. Um, I think that the key thing is we have apps that drive value. Um, you know, we've, we have a number of um, folks out there that are kind of scouting and, and looking for application um, developers to put onto our platform. It's how we ended up working with Quilt um on cdn and 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 you know there's always going to be a huge demand for trying to find the right app but but i think if i was an application developer i'd focus on building an app that drives you know that that, that would drive telcos to want to work with me um you know we're out there looking um constantly i think yeah i mean obviously i think it, it's hard to ignore the cloud providers but um there's a lot of things they can't do um that, that we can um, and, and a, a lot of things we can enable. Um, and we're working with a lot of video game companies for, for edge platform uh, games that they're working directly with us. So um, I think what everyone said, I completely agree, but focus on building the great app. Okay, excellent. Great, thank you, Neil. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I think at this point we'll move on, Guy, to the next question. Yeah, thanks, Ray. And a reminder to our viewers, keep the questions coming, please. We'll get through as many of them as we can. Uh, Francesca, it's also your first time on The After Show. So, as you might guess, we're going to ask you the same question as we did, Michael. How did you get your start in telecoms? Yeah, uh, so uh, I did a degree in telecommunication, so no surprise in, uh, in my career. When I finished my degree, I had the opportunity to join a PhD from Eindhoven University and on, uh, on fiber, or to do an MSc for studying the theory of propagation for wireless. And I was struggling with this decision, and I decided to do the latter one. Um, and uh, in terms of my career, I spent the most of my, my career in, in the vendor side, working for NEC Corporation. Um, I, was, I started with a very technical role, uh, attending 3GPP and doing IPR on 4G architecture and protocol focusing on, on SON. And then moving on, I joined a business development team to try to convince you know, the industry that multi-vendor headnet is possible because 3GPP has uh, uh, specified all the protocol on, uh, on X2 to, to interface to enable that. Eventually, as the industry moved from product-centric to solution-centric, I decided to head the solution strategy team in NEC, working on a digital transformation solution and creating synergy across uh, uh, partners to enable ICT, uh, ICT solution. And, uh, and then finally, I decided to go to the service provider world. Then I joined Colt as an emerging technology director and really creating synergy across emerging tech, IoT, AI, 5G, and Edge, uh, co-creating and co-innovating with partners and customers. Just one of small things I want to mention. In 2011, I was really rethinking my career, and I was very fascinated by the world of the traders and cities, so I decided to do uh, an MSc in uh, mathematical trading and finance. Uh, but eventually, after being offered that job from an investment bank, I, I refused, and I decided that, uh, I don't know, the telco gives 
much smaller gives much more benefits to the community than finance. So I stayed and I'm very happy. Excellent. And, and, and so are we. And message to all the graduates out there who, who are lured by the temptation of working in the city. Don't bother. Telecoms is the way. And, and wireless. Great choice with wireless back then. I mean, what would have happened if you went the fiber route? Oh, who knows? Thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's, that's great. Um, Francesca, let's move on to our, our next audience question. Um, because we, we are getting quite a few coming in and we want to get through as many as we can. The, the, the question is, could smaller telcos, tier three telcos, could they partner with the big tier ones for edge hosting? And, and if they do, you know, is there any value in this for the larger tier ones? Yes, uh, definitely. And it's either that one or even tier one who are incumbent in a region and they want to expand in other region. And I, I mean, in our case, this is one use case that is part of our edge strategy. And we're already working and discussing with uh, two tier one who are incumbent in, uh, in uh, some Asian region and they want to expand and they're looking from, you know, uh, someone who, can, who could offer an infrastructure where they can host either, you know, some SD1 capabilities or it could be a 5G cloud native stack. So there, there, again, there is lots of opportunity, but definitely this is one use case that uh, is going to drive our edge, edge strategy. And I can tell there is demand, demand from our you know, wholesale and other telco partners. Oh, that's good to hear. Thank you for that, Francesca. Uh, any of other guests got any thoughts about uh, partnering be between telcos, especially the smaller ones looking to partner with the larger ones? Neil? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> look, I think, um you have to go where your customers are. So if your customers are close to a you know, um, network where another operator provides it, then you're going to have to work with them in some ways. And we've, we've largely been doing that for forever. So I think there will be opportunities. I think the challenge is going to be, um, you know, do I, it's all around prioritization. Do I prioritize working with, you know, this big cloud application that's going to generate tons of cash for me? Or do I do a wholesale deal where I'm going to get, perhaps, if I'm lucky, 10, maybe 15% of the whole deal? Um, I think that will be, I think for some operators, that will be the, the big issue to, to how do they ensure that the, the tier one who, in many respects, you know, everyone thinks tier ones are, you've got loads of central offices and loads of exchanges. Um, we do, but they're not really engineered for kind of modern data center type um, platforms. So... You know, it's a finite resource that you know we want to use to the to the maximum to gain gain the maximum benefit. But I absolutely think um, operators will will work with each other. There's no question about it. All right. Thanks, Neil. Some good uh, edgenomic strategies there for everyone to consider. Eve. Yes, and if I may, I would even even extend these the partnership opportunities to other companies like the um, the telcos. Uh, these are also companies who can play some role into that field, but j just to be to see uh, if there is value in that. But it's not only between uh, large and small operators. Yes. Thank you, Eve. Appreciate your answer there. Uh, yes, Michael. Just just one other comment around that. <clears throat> I think that there is a huge opportunity for the carriers to partner with the smaller providers. Um, I, I do believe, though, there's a challenge that folks might not be aware of, and that's that technology that those smaller carriers have. If they have not made the leap um, to the 5G services, to you know, platforms that can deliver containerized applications, I think there's going to be a challenge there uh, in partnering. Uh, however, that being said, there's a huge opportunity for the uh, larger carriers to capture real estate. And those uh, smaller carriers can provide a, a real estate advantage at the edge. And I think that's something that needs to be looked at and, and figure out how to monetize that. Great. Well, thank you for those comments, Michael. And uh, Terrier, you'd like to comment as well? Yeah, maybe I'm bo boring, but I completely agree, I guess, with <laughs> everyone else. Uh, so so uh, for me, it's, it's there are clear roles on hosting. Uh, and then we can argue uh, and discuss about uh, what, what level uh, should it be. Should it be on the infrastructure? Well, I think what Neil is saying on the 
on the hosting, for example, and, and, the, and the power and the connectivity? Should it be, I think Francesca walked through earlier, for example, on the infrastructure platform and services. So they're, they're, for me, there they're are clearly there are roles for, for someone to uh, offer hosting services. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of convinced also that the tier one uh, providers will uh, will address this as one opportunity. Maybe not in the same at the same level and, and uh, in all the markets, but at least in a lot of markets. Sure, yeah, not the same level as you say, but it's, it's, it's an opportunity. It's, it's an option there. That's great. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. I think we have uh, probably um, exhausted that topic as well. In which case, uh, I'll hand uh, over to Ray. OK, thanks, Guy. Uh, so, uh, Terje, we're going to come to you first with this question. And it's another question related to our round table uh, that we pushed live earlier. And the question is that the panel today discussed the need for network aware application developers. Uh, is there a shortage of this kind of developer or is it that developers don't have the knowledge or incentive to work on networking elements? Okay, so a, a, a question here very about a specific uh, subset of the developer uh, community. Um, uh, any thoughts there? Is this a, are there more? Is there more demand for these kind of application developers, uh, and are there more of them coming forward now? Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a great question, and uh, what we also discussed earlier, I think it's uh, a need, as I see it, at least, to raise the, or improve the awareness, both from the network side and also the application side. So it's it's mutual in the sense. So it's a kind of at least a two-sided uh, question in that sense. Uh, so so the so the the issue is, uh, which I think, which when I'm reading the question, is that um, uh, coming from the historic or or uh, how it has been so far. Uh, and the, the way I would probably address it is like uh, we are thinking about this like in a call it a two track uh, logic uh, where where the first track is a bit similar to how we are doing the broadband services and access to Internet today. And then we can, of course, definitely argue about uh, is the incentives there uh, are the different kind of companies, you know, investing in, in infrastructure and connectivity and other kind of companies uh, uh, investing in applications. So so there is a there is a missing link uh, connecting those two. Uh, and that's, of course, some uh, one model which is valid for uh, for some part of these uh, cases what we have been discussing so far. Uh, and uh, and then definitely there is a second track uh, which are for, typically within the B two B maybe uh, use cases so far, uh, where the logic is rather different uh, because there are different companies then who are uh, uh, paying for or leasing or owning uh, a number of components. And then of course there is an internal inherent incentive. Uh, to improve both uh, the resources and also the experience and uh, uh, and how the, the devices and applications are, be are behaving. So, so in uh, some of these use cases, what we have seen is clearly from the day number one, uh, a need to be uh, uh, aware both of the performance and the latency uh, and maybe also the confidentiality or the autonomy of the, of the network, uh, for example, from, from the applications in order to behave in the right way uh, and vice versa. While we see that in some of these use cases, which are probably similar to call it internet to access or uh, access to internet uh, kind of cases, the incentive is not that strong for a moment. Uh, and then we, let, uh, we need probably need to work together uh, to see uh, if we can strengthen that. Because in my mind, uh, there are clearly uh, great benefits to improve the awareness across the network uh, and application. Okay, thanks, uh, Terje. Uh, Neil, we'll come to you next, uh, and then Francesca. So, Neil, is there a shortage of uh, network-aware developers? Um, I think it. I think it depends on what you make. What you mean by network-aware? Look, everything we're doing, even today on this live broadcast, there was a network-aware developer that's made this work. But I, I kind of look to you know what we're doing in Open RAN with the RIC and X apps which is a kind of engaging at the network at a kind of new and different layer than, than probably developers have ever had access to. I think there is, I think we as an industry need to figure out how we open the kind of Rick and X Labs capability up for developers to come up with ideas that probably we as telcos would never think of. And, and I definitely think, you know, Open RAN's new, the, you know, the Rick and the X apps, what, it's, it's a year old, the, the, the kind of strategy and, and standards around that. So for sure, there's going to be folks that um, need to learn that and need to, to catch up with it. But again, I, I go back to my previous point. Um, the coolest app developers will figure those things out and, and will make it happen. It's one of the 
it's one of the glorious things about the internet is is the the, the ingenious of of developers that that make things happen that and, and make them happen in a way that we wondered how our life was able to cope without this application so i'm i'm excited about what what the next 10 years of applications are going to look like and what apps you know today i've got um you know uber and uber eats on on my phone that, you know, i can't imagine not having that 10 years ago especially well <laughs> when we were traveling you just got off the plane you you get an uber over to your hotel now um what's what's the apps over the next 10 years you know we've had netflix we've we've had some of the the video gaming applications um what can cool developers do with with the rick and with x apps to offer our capabilities to customers that you know we probably haven't really spent long enough dreaming about uh, absolutely yeah and uh it is hard to imagine uh, life now. Ten years ago, these apps didn't exist, uh, and now we're using them uh, every day. Uh, uh, Francesca, you wanted to come in on this as well. Yes, very shortly. The point I want to make is that, yes, we need network-aware application, not only during development phase, but also once they are rolled out. And that's because, you know, as applications are moving to the cloud, there is a key trend, a key requirement to enable differentiated experience and in order to do that we need a network aware application and an application aware networks and this is done through you know developing ai in between those two layers that maximize the synergy between the application and the network taking telemetry from both of them and uh, uh, and optimizing the parameterization of uh, of the two layers Okay, yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, if we don't have any further um, answers to this question, I think I'll hand back over to Guy at this point. Back to you, Guy. Yeah, thank you, Ray. Well, it's time to check on, on our audience poll because we have a new poll for each day of the summit. It's just one question with five mm -hmm. multiple choice answers and it's right here on the website. It's quick and easy to complete. And today's question is, is edge computing necessary for a successful 5G enterprise services strategy? And we've got answer choices there ranging from absolutely yes to um, absolutely not. And you can see the current real-time split of opinions right here. So it's, um, it's certainly, how should we say, in the positive half. Um, yeah, the second one down there, um, most services, enable most services, 65%. That's terrific. Well, let us know what you think and click on your answer selection because we're keeping the polls open all week and the more responses we get, the more representative it's going to be. And final numbers and analysis will be shared after this summer. Right, back to our Q&A because we are about ooh, 42, 43 minutes into the program now. We have been chatting quite a lot. Uh, we've still got time to squeeze in at least one more question. Um, so let's see what we can do. Ray, do we have a, another question we can get in? Uh, we do, and I'm going to try and make sure that I make proper uh, sense of this. This has come in uh, while the show has been going. Um, and so this is uh, a reference to how operators are using uh, edge and cloud assets for their open RAN strategies. And the question sort of says there's two reference trends, two reference architectures currently in the market. There's Rakuten Mobile uh, using uh, COTS platforms uh, to roll out its network, and DISH is going uh, all in on public cloud. And the question is who is right? It's, it's a real, it's a devil's advocate, advocate question here. Which one is right? Somebody must be right, somebody must be wrong. But it, two very distinct and clear approaches here. Uh, does anybody want to come in and, and uh, tackle this question at all? Uh, two very different approaches. Uh, okay, uh, Neil, we'll start with you and then we'll come to Terya. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, right or wrong, an interesting question. Um, Look, I think the way I look at it is, is we need to experiment and try, you know, various different approaches to it. Personally speaking, um, if I'm running, you know, a, a mission critical network where lives are dependent upon it, I, I find it quite challenging to put things into the public cloud. You know, just if you have if you have a problem or a challenge, you just don't have the right access to 
the things that you need where, where if you own that infrastructure yourself. So right now I'd kind of, I kind of sway towards uh, the Rakuten approach and, 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 but, but I'd also say over time things change. You know, I remember the days where no one wanted an MPLS VPN and ATM was the future. Um, and thankfully ATM is long, long, long memory that still gives me shakes when I think about it. But, um, you know, it, it, in, in my mind, it's, it's, there is no right or wrong answer, and and actually, even if you pick the right, suppose one, suppose Rakuten is the right answer or Dish is the right answer, how you execute on it can be the whether you whether you survive or not. And and you talked about skills and application development earlier on. I, I think we in Telco really lack strong kind of server, cloud. Um, infrastructure expertise. You know, most of the real experts in this are in the, the hyperscalers, and and I think in whatever model we choose, we need to bring more skills and more capability into our own organisations to build the right platform or select the right platform. Um, and of course, public cloud—it's so expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Good note to end on there, Neil. <laughs> I'm sure we might get more <laughs> questions now coming in after the show. Uh, Terry, we'll, we'll come over to you. So I guess is it a private cloud for Open RAN or public cloud for Open RAN at the edge? Yeah, just uh, Tom, I fully agree with the, what Neil was saying. So I think in my mind, uh, it's uh, to be very short. It's a uh, question of what do you want to achieve uh, and what's your current capabilities uh, in order to achieve that? So, so uh, if you don't have it in-house, you probably need to partner up. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there are different, um, Rakuten as, as one company is quite different, for example, uh, compared to Dish and the starting points and so on. So you can look into uh, probably the reasons why they have chosen the different uh, approaches and also the starting points and, and when they started and what they want to, what they want to achieve uh, as part of not only the mobile business maybe, but also in a broader context. Uh, then, of course, it's uh, also what we discussed uh, earlier uh, what Neil is saying that the economics needs to be right, uh, and uh, there might be a challenge, of course, in some of the cases to get the economics right. Uh, so, so we need to partner up and work together much closer. I think uh, across different uh, companies could be uh, both on the own built uh, hardware and the own uh, built uh, cloud components, also with the with the hyperscalers. So, so uh, probably a collaboration in 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 all sense in that in that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you make a great point about the, the, the timing as well. Um, you know, six months now is, is such a long time in this industry and can, can change the kind of decisions that are being made. Uh, Michael, we'll come to you. Yeah, just a, a quick comment on that, because I, I've been fascinated with the different approaches. I, I don't think it has to be one approach or the other. I, I think just like you see hybrid cloud nowadays, a combination of public and private cloud, um, I think you're going to see the same thing happen at the edge, a uh, hybrid edge, um, where you're going to be uh, having very, uh, very efficient um, cloud computing capabilities at the edge, right? Delivering private cloud. Um, and you will tie into those public uh, cloud infrastructures as well. I don't see it being one or the other. I do agree, though, um, as other folks have said, that you need to know what your use case is. If you don't know what the use case is and what numbers you're trying to drive at the end of the day, which deliver you a certain amount of monetization, you could be going down a very, very bad path. Now, the good thing is you can probably, you know, pivot and shift and go in a different direction uh, with your approach. And we may see that. I, I think you may see that um, in some of the deployments that are going out right now. Uh, there is also some opportunity around interoperability. Um, so you may be able to tie in different solutions which accelerate one piece of that or the other. Um, but I don't, I don't think we can get to a good definitive answer yet. Um, I do know that, you know, whenever we're working around very high efficient uh, far edge type capabilities, and we know that that's where we're going to sit for now. Um, and there are other companies that are going to try to get into that space that maybe don't necessarily drive those same efficiencies. So we're going to see what happens. I think it's going to be a partnership at the end of the day um, with very extensible type solutions that tie in different partners. That's what I'm thinking at least. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and we'll come to Neil and then Eve. Yeah, I just, just wanted to add, don't forget the public cloud and, and your private cloud, they're both running Linux, they're both running Kubernetes, and eventually, you know, we're both going to move serverless. So, you know, the difference is, 
it's in it's in the it's in the thin kind of margins of this. I think it's more around capacity and and control, um, and and also ensuring that you know those real those real live apps are there. And also, you know, I think the other key thing about the public cloud is the public cloud is not everywhere. It's not where my customers are. Um, so I think that that brings another part. But ultimately, it's Linux, it's Kubernetes, it's serverless. Um, they're all the same at the end of the day. Thanks, Neil. Uh, and Eve, over to you. Uh, yes, and on the factors that were mentioned, in, I would add one, which is maybe the one also Neil just um, addressed, the uh, capacity and the scalability. Scalability, not only on the technical side, but also on the business case side. And when it comes to up and run today, in fact, basically what we are following is the kind of what I would say the uh, European way, which is going to a private cloud and, and trying to narrow down the cases through the MOU between the various um, operators and trying to define a, a European way to implement up and run that, that, that fits the, our needs, which differs significantly from the need from new operators, whether they are in, in Asia or in the US. Okay. Brilliant. Great. Thank you very much, Eve. Um, and I think uh, looking at our clock, uh, we've over overrun our time, Guy. I think we, we might get charged extra by whoever's running our platform. Fortunately, it's us. We'll charge ourselves a very high amount of money for running over here today. But we're, we're not quite finished yet, so I'll hand back over to you for the final leg of the show. Yeah, excellent strategy there, Ray. Yeah, thanks very much. It, it is the end of the show, and what a great show it's been. What a terrific discussion from our guests. Thank you all very much indeed for, for joining us on this live programme. Uh, and to our audience for sending in questions. We had more we couldn't get to, but hopefully we will tomorrow, because we will be back tomorrow with another live after show programme. But before we go, we want to let you know about what's coming up on day two of the Edgenomics Summit. Yes, we have a roundtable discussion that considers the justification of telco edge computing, followed by a second discussion that looks at how to integrate edge with 5G and Open RAN. But we want to leave you with a special preview of what's on Telecom TV all next week as we turn the spotlight on 5G. Very exciting. I can't wait. But we're going to have to because we've got one more day of the Edgenomic Summit. So please join us again tomorrow. Goodbye for now. The After Show was recorded in front of a live online audience.